In this second lecture, um, I'm going to talk about um, uh, migration dynamics and the change in the um, city landscape. Then, in the first lecture on cities, I talked about the massive growth of cities, the huge growth of megacities, and also the fact that for the first time in human history, half of the people in the world live in a city. Now, in order to understand this change, in order to understand how and why this has happened, we need to look at migration processes or how it is that people move to cities. So the critically important question is not just how people are born into cities and live there for all of their lives, but what is driving people into cities? What is leading to the experience of migration into cities? How can we explain this process? And what, um, if we look at this migration process and the dynamic of the urban landscape, you know, it helps us explain why cities look the way they do and why neighborhoods look the way that they do. So, um, it, Migration it has been really the critical way in which cities have grown. Um, and um, migration is central to both the growth of cities, but also to changes in the dynamics of cities. And in particular, um, uh, the patterns of migration of how it is that distinct neighborhoods emerge and transform. Before you is a picture of Little Italy in Manhattan. And Little Italy is a neighborhood in um, the southern part of Manhattan where, as the name suggests, Italians moved to. So as um, uh, uh, Italians migrated away from Italy towards the United States, they tended to collect in Little Italy. Little Italy barely exists in Manhattan today. And if, if anything, it just, it, you know, it, it kind of exists in some ways as a historical um, monument. And Little Italy has been engulfed by Chinatown. Um, so uh, Little Italy is basically surrounded by the area now um, that we call Chinatown in Manhattan. And Chinatown was obviously, kind of, uh, maybe, uh, the place where Chinese migrants moved to. Um, the place where um, Chinese migrants into the United States first set foot um, or moved to or lived in. And interestingly, Chinatown is not really Chinatown anymore uh, as well. Uh, so um, the Chinatown that exists in Lower Manhattan has largely you know, been transformed. Uh, it's still like Little Italy exists because people have set up businesses, restaurants, you know, different kinds of shops, and so you can go there. But most Chinese people don't move to Chinatown in New York anymore. They moved to a separate Chinatown um, in Queens, in Flushing. And in that Chinatown, it's the new place that migrants have moved to. This points to how patterns of migration, explained by what we refer to as push and pull factors, are central to the understanding of cities, and in particular to their layout, to how it is that different neighborhoods emerge. Now, by push and pull factors, we mean there are some factors that push people away from where they currently live, and then there are some factors that pull people in to um, uh, new contexts. So, for example, um, uh, my, my mother migrated in the 1960s, uh, um, actually in the early 1970s to the United States, and so she was not part of the major wave of Irish migration that happened to the United States, which was because of the Irish potato famine in the middle part of the 19th century. That was a push factor. There was a huge degree of starvation happening in Ireland. And because of that mass of starvation, there was a big push for Irish people to move out of Ireland. So they got, in some ways, pushed out because they were starving. Um, and uh, as the sort of phrase goes in Ireland, at the, the potato famine, a third of the country died, a third of the country migrated, and a third remained. Um, it's not exactly accurate, but it's not terribly wrong. So there are lots of 
times where people are in, in effect pushed out of contexts. They may want to stay where they are, but they kind of just can't. Other reasons would be if you live in a very rural area, you may be pushed out of that rural area. Not because you want to leave the rural area, but because there are no jobs, or maybe there's no opportunities for you to, to meet someone and start a family of your own. Maybe land ownership works in a way that you get pushed out, that you have an older sibling who's going to work the farm and you have no opportunity to remain yourself and actually have ownership over any land, and so you get pushed away. So one set of factors for migration are push factors, things that push you away from where you currently are. Another set of factors are pull factors, things that pull you towards them. So places that serve to pull you in because of, say, the opportunities that they might provide. And so cities um, uh, aren't just places that take people who've been pushed out from where they are. They're also places that serve as beacons, that lure people in, that pull them towards themselves because of the opportunities that they provide. And the something critical to the life of cities is being able to recruit new people to participate in city life. So just because you get pushed out of where you are doesn't mean you go anywhere randomly. In fact, typically you get pulled into some place because of what it might be able to provide. Now these dynamics help us see how you get things like neighborhoods that are ethnically associated. Sociologists in the Chicago School, and the Chicago School of Sociology is one of the earliest schools of sociology um, from the late uh, 19th to early 20th century, sort of 1890s to about 1920s. They studied neighborhoods in Chicago, and they were particularly interested in ethnic enclaves, or how it was the different neighborhoods had different kinds of people living in them. So that there was the Chinese neighborhood, there was the Polish neighborhood, there was a neighborhood of African Americans, there were maybe neighborhoods of um, Mexicans, not at the time there wasn't really, uh, but there were neighborhoods of Irish people, Italian people. And that these different ethnic enclaves tended to be how people ended up moving to cities. Um, what these Chicago sociologists argued was that new entries into the city were sorted into the communities that provided the best fit and then continued to move through the city in ways that had distinct patterns. One of the phrases that we use to describe this is, a, is chain migration, or how it is that people migrate in chains connected back to where they were from. So that if you, know, you um, look to see who has moved to New York from China, what you'll discover is that people don't randomly move from China to New York. There's people from particular regions and even particular towns who end up in New York. And why? Well, because they know of a Chinatown there. They know of a place they can go where they will still speak the language. They will know some people they'll be connected to them. And then they can develop a set of resources in that space and then leave that space after they've created a foundation of support, knowledge, and awareness of what it's like to be in America. So when Mexicans move to the US, they don't move randomly. They don't just pick a random town to go to. They tend to go somewhere where they know there will be other Mexicans. When people from the Philippines they don't move randomly. They tend to move to places where they know there will be other people like them. This helps provide them with social support and community. In the picture of Little Italy here that you see, many of the people in that picture probably only spoke Italian. So in order for them to get around in the city, they actually needed to live around other Italian people because they didn't speak English. We see the same thing today in Chinatown in Flushing where in Flushing, many of the street signs are written in Cantonese. They're written literally not in English. Um, and you can traverse that space only speaking either Cantonese or Mandarin. You can basically get around without um, speaking in English. 
And this is enormously beneficial because it allows people to transition to a neighborhood, to develop a set of skills, knowledge, and capacities, and then to move through, often leave the city. So places like Little Italy and places like Chinatown are often transitory spaces where people move in, they might stay for two or three years, and then they move out. They move somewhere else, away from that place. This, though, helps tell us something about neighborhoods. Immigrants begin in neighborhoods where they can interact with other people from the same background, speak the same language, and so forth. And over time, they begin to move outward, to leave the immigrant enclaves that they're in to new parts of the city, transforming those new places, but also themselves often embracing a new culture of their new home um, and uh, moving into a more mainstream labor force. Um, we could call this process a kind of process of assimilation. But what that points to is um, the, the, the fact that neighborhoods in cities as ethnic enclaves emerge not because immigrants don't want to assimilate into a country. It, they actually serve to facilitate the integration of immigrants into a new space by giving them social ties, cultural resources, so social and cultural capital, in order to be able to then survive away from the enclave itself and in the, the society more generally. Um, and so uh, um, what this means is that if we look at cities, we often find really distinctly patterned neighborhoods in cities. And some of these neighborhoods um, are not tied to international migration, but they can be tied to national migration or within nation migration. So in some cities, it will be uh, neighborhoods where um, low wage rural workers move into those neighborhoods. And that's kind of where they live and they, often move because somebody else from their village that they know moved into that space and it gives them access to housing and healthcare and food and labor employment. Um, and in the United States, the most perhaps dramatic example of migration is not international migration, but instead what we call the great migration or the migration of black Americans from the South to the North, which is one of the largest migrations the United States has ever seen millions upon millions of people moving from the south to the north. And what are the dynamics that we see within those moves? Well, dynamics of creating neighborhoods. N neighborhoods in part because um, black Americans were excluded from living in neighborhoods along near whites, um, but also neighborhoods that facilitated this great migration, that helped facilitate a migration of people from one area to another and that created a dense cluster of like people um, um, living together. In the United States, um, um, we cannot make sense of uh, a life in the US without looking at immigration. And here is a picture of Chinatown um, with actually closed stores. It's probably just early in the morning um, in Manhattan. Um, but uh, uh, there are 44 million US residents who were born outside of the country. So um, um, nearly 15% of the American population is born outside of the United States. Um, this is a huge, huge number of people. Um, and the Chicago School was interested primarily when they were looking at Chicago and neighborhood change at the experiences of European migrants, Polish, Italian, um, Irish uh, um, migrants moving into different ethnic communities within Chicago. But today, um, uh, the immigration that the US is experiencing is different. Um, uh, um, so in 1965, the United States fundamentally transformed its immigration laws. And the transformation of those immigration laws meant that immigrants started to come from very different parts of the world. And so we have a new experience of immigration since 1965 in the United States. And that new experience of immigration is one where immigrants come from places like India, China, Mexico, the Philippines, and El Salvador. 
Um, um, so those are the largest number of immigrants that we have. As I've said before in these lectures, both of my parents are immigrants. So my father migrated from Pakistan and my mother migrated from Ireland. And both of their migration was facilitated by the transformation of the migration laws in 1965. Um, these new migrants are fundamentally transforming the face of the United States. Um, uh, um, we also have a massive rise in migration from Africa. And this massive rise of African migration, which I mentioned earlier in a lecture on race, is having profound effects on um, uh, uh, the experience of people, um, uh, uh, both white and black, by transforming some of the character of blackness in American life. And so um, what we as sociologists who, who study cities are interested in is not just the dynamics of cities as growing populations, but also the dynamics of migration and the importance of migration um, to understanding city life. As I said earlier, um, there are um, multiple sort of challenges to or barriers to migration. Um, and here uh, we see a segregated uh, drinking fountain in the Jim Crow South. And so what the picture sh shows is a drinking fountain and then a sign that says colored, um, which meant that colored people, not white people, were allowed to use that fountain. They weren't allowed to use other kinds of fountains. So both legal and informal discrimination and intimidation um, uh, has highly constrained the capacity of African Americans to um, move uh, residentially. So some of the pattern that we spoke about where immigrants um, or migrants would move into a neighborhood, become integrated into that neighborhood, develop social um, uh, uh, skills, cultural ties, have a job, and then move out of that neighborhood when they could, was not, were not experienced by African Americans in the United States, partially because they were highly constrained in the neighborhoods that they could live in. Um, and so uh, uh, their capacity to move to an ethnic or racial enclave and then move out of it to more fully assimilate did not happen for in the ways that it did for other white ethnic groups. So white ethnics would move into an ethnic enclave, um, Italians would move to Little Italy, and then they could move out of that enclave into white neighborhoods. And this facilitated their integration into whiteness. Um, and uh, uh, there's entire tracks of work explaining how it is that migrants, say, from Ireland became white. That is how they moved into these enclaves in the city and then moved out of them into white neighborhoods and were integrated into the category of whiteness. So Black Americans did not experience the same thing, in part because of discrimination and intimidation they were kept out of particular neighborhoods. And you know, the Chicago School, which was deeply interested in ethnic enclaves, um, uh, did not pay attention to barriers to mobility and assimilation within some segments of the population. And so um, this, uh, these barriers to assimilation are very important for some groups because they limit their overall mobility. They limit their mobility. African Americans in Chicago were confined to one specific section of the city. Um, uh, and so uh, in, 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 well, a couple of sections eventually, but in, in one part in the south side of the city. And they faced extreme discrimination and violence when they attempted to move beyond the boundaries of what was called the Black Belt, where they were allowed to live. And so, um, we shouldn't think that this process of moving to a neighborhood, developing um, labor market opportunities, social ties, um, and some degree of cultural assimilation, and then moving out into another neighborhood is universal. If we think about the importance of race to these dynamics, we see um, how it is uh, that it's not quite so smooth for all racial and ethnic groups. Um, uh, that the Chicago explanation may apply to white migrants from Europe 
but may not make as much sense to the internal migration of African Americans, or perhaps the migration of Africans, or perhaps the migration of Latinos, or perhaps the migration of certain Asian communities. This still requires a lot of uh, more understanding. So, um, Harvey Mollich um, talks about uh, the urban growth machine um, and how cities are obsessed with growth, the necessity to constantly grow and grow and grow. And recent models of urban change have paid closer attention to how it is that political power and economic interests affect patterns of change within a city. And so here's a picture of PNC Park, um, PNC um, being a bank, and this is a baseball field. And um, uh, this is something where a coalition of economic, political, and cultural elites worked together to shape the landscape of the city with the goal of attracting new populations and expanding economic activity. Um, so this redevelopment of Pittsburgh, um, of which PNC Park is a, a case, provides an example of what Harvey Mollich has called the urban growth machine and how growth machine politics, this constant and relentless attempts at growing, can change the entire landscape of one part of the city. You might think about other examples of places where, um, you know, think about where you live right now yourself um, and ask, what is the coalition of kind of like political and economic actors that are seeking through development to fundamentally transform the landscape of the city? Um, you should note that this is not a new process. It's not like this fundamental transformation of urban landscapes is something brand new that's only just started to happen. Um, huge swaths of European cities were replanned as part of a growth process. And in it, major groups of people were, um, uh, uh, like large numbers of people, were basically kicked out of the city or their neighborhoods destroyed. So if you ever walk down the Champs-Elysees in uh, France, one of the most famous streets in France, um, you should know that that was formerly a kind of a dense urban neighborhood uh, where a bunch of um, poorer people lived in part of it and they, their neighborhood was bulldozed. They basically um, uh, cleared out all of the people living there and created this new redesigned big street that sort of is now an iconic example of um, some of the physical design of Paris, but at the time um, was involved with the major removal of people off tracts of land in order to support growth, development, and change. And so as these new political, economic, and cultural elites gather together with the aim of growth, we might ask, who gets left behind? Who's considered as important? What kinds of growth are valuable? And why is, are certain kinds of things economically supported? Sports stadiums are enormously contentious because they require huge amounts of money and often the public pays for them, even though the public doesn't own the sports team, some private corporation or individual does. And yet they're given millions, sometimes billions of dollars in order to build these new spaces where people can go if they buy a ticket, but they effectively, the people of Pittsburgh funded this um, uh, uh, new um, space. Those who argue in favor of this kind of development project will say, well, there'll be all of these jobs associated with this new space. And think about the economic impact and opportunity for the local restaurants and bars, for the people who can get a job working in the stadium. You know, it can be open around the year for other things like concerts. There's a large opportunity here for urban development and growth. This idea of seeking to constantly have growth opportunities is something that deeply appeals to economic, cultural, and political elites. It may not appeal as much to the vast majority of the people who live in a city, who live somewhere. And so um, uh, we can think about how cities compete with one another and compete for economic investment in order to grow, to constantly grow, and how the populations of cities themselves experience this. So part of the idea of growing is to create pull factors into your city. 
people should want to move there. You're pulling them in because of the opportunities that you're providing for them. But for the people who already live in that city, the question becomes, what does this mean for our life? What does it mean for those of us who live here? What are the consequences for us um, uh, uh, in terms of the urban spaces that we're living in? 